Uh, brilliant. Good morning and uh, welcome everybody to this latest uh, briefing uh, session by the British Palestine All Party Parliamentary Group in conjunction with CARBU and Medical Aid for Palestinians. Um, we thought that this would be a good opportunity to uh, discuss the ongoing developments on the issue of apartheid and the crime of apartheid in Israel. Uh, the latest report from Amnesty, the work already being done by Human Rights Watch and of course a plethora of other organisations. This is the second briefing on this issue and we have some fantastic speakers. I'm just trying to look across the screen to make sure that we have the speakers already in. Um, so, uh, do we have Amnesty? I just want to double check that we have the speaker from Amnesty before I introduce them. We do. Hi, I'm Saleh. Yeah. Saleh's in. All right, brilliant. Thanks, Saleh. Um, so, uh, the session is going to be just under an hour now. We need to be finished for 11 o'clock. We have four speakers. I understand that each speaker will speak for about five minutes, and then we should have about 20 minutes uh, for Q&A. I think the easiest way to deal with Q&A is either to put the information in the chat section, or if you raise your hands, hopefully I'll keep an eye on everybody's screens and I will be able to call the questions. The event is being recorded. If anybody has an issue with that, I think, again, if you can put that in the chat section and the administrators will be able to pick that up. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to our first speaker, Saleh Hijazi, who is the head of office and deputy regional director of Amnesty International's regional office in Israel and Palestine. Over to you, Saleh. Thank you very much. Um, a great pleasure and honor to be uh, with you today and speaking. Thanks very much for, for the opportunity. Uh, so what, what, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll go over quickly um, uh, the report and the findings. I'll talk a little bit. All right, yeah, sorry, I think when you unmuted everybody, you also unmuted me again. So uh, I hope everyone can hear me now. Um, and I was just saying thanks and honor and really great pleasure. Um, and and uh, uh, just kind of a brief about what, what I'll do um, and then be looking forward to the discussion. So I'm gonna go over the report findings um, uh, very quickly, talk a little bit about the methodology and um, how we came about uh, uh, this report um, and then a few a uh, few other points about kind of going forward uh, before before I end. So um, uh, the report titled uh, "Israel's Apartheid Against Palestinians: Cruel System of Domination and Crime Against Humanity" illustrates how, since its establishment in 1948, Israel has pursued a policy of establishing and maintaining Jewish demographic hegemony and maximizing its control over land to benefit Jewish Israelis while restricting the rights of Palestinians and preventing Palestinian refugees who were forcibly displaced from their homes in 1948 and 1967 from returning to their homes. In 1967, Israel extended this policy to the West Bank and Gaza Strip, which it has occupied ever since. Amnesty International in this report has analyzed Israel's intent to create and maintain a system of oppression and domination over Palestinians and examined its key components, which are one, territor territorial fragmentation, segregation and control, dispossession of land and property, and the denial of economic and social rights. The report concludes that this system amounts to apartheid. It has also in the report documented unlawful acts committed by Israel against Palestinians with the, with the intent to maintain the system of oppression and domination including one, forcible transfers, two, administrative detention and torture, three, unlawful killings, and four, the denial of basic rights and freedoms and persecution. The report concludes that such acts form part of a systematic as well as widespread attack directed against the Palestinian population and amount to the crime against humanity of apartheid. We call on Israel to dismantle this cruel system and we call on the international community to pressure Israel to do so. We're also calling on all those with jurisdiction over the crimes committed to maintain the system, to investigate them. So this is briefly the findings of the 280 page report that we put out on the 1st of February and with it have launched, launched the campaign. Uh, the report 
uh, took four years uh, uh, to produce. Uh, it is based on a global policy that Amnesty has set and enacted in 2017, uh, which uh, includes a definition of the crime of apartheid as based on in, under international law, both uh, definition is drawn from the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and the Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, as well as analysis of uh, apartheid under international human rights law. This policy also includes guidelines. It's a tool also for uh, amnesty research uh, researchers all around the world to use for whenever uh, they want to look into situations of institutionalized discrimination and see whether such situations amount to apartheid. The first instance of this policy being used and, and the guidelines being used was in the situation of Myanmar, looking at the treatment of the Rohingya Muslims in the Krakhine state, state, reaching the conclusion that the crime against humanity of apartheid is being perpetrated uh, against uh, the Rohingya population in the Rakhine state there. This is the second instance where uh, Amnesty's uh, application of the guidelines have uh, allowed us to reach the uh, determination and the finding that here Israel is imposing a system and a crime against humanity of apartheid against Palestinians. Uh, in uh, researching and writing the report, we uh, did an in-depth analysis of the body of laws, policies, and practices uh, that Israel imposes on Palestinians and restricts or controls the rights of Palestinians in Israel and occupied Palestinian territories and in relation to Palestinian refugees, particularly by denying them the right of return. We've also uh, revisited and reanalyzed systematic documentation that we've carried out over the last couple of decades, uh, including uh, on case studies, uh, the report includes over 30 case studies of individuals and communities some of which Amnesty has documented human rights violations against, reported on, and campaigned for, uh, for over two decades. Um, as you all know, um, this is not the first report, and we have colleagues here who also put out reports before Amnesty. Um, uh, uh, I think it's very important to recognize and say that this would not have been possible without really the work of Palestinian human rights defenders and organizations who pioneered this work for over two decades. Uh, they have started using the legal framework uh, of apartheid as defined under international law, and have really led the, the, the way for then Israeli human rights organizations, Yashdin and Betselem uh, in, in particular, and then Human Rights Watch uh, last year, and now uh, Amnesty International. And with this, we believe, and we'd like to say that we have completed the consensus among the international human rights movement working on human rights in Israel and Palestine, that Israel is perpetrating the crime against humanity of apartheid against Palestinians in Israel, in the occupied Palestinian territories, and in relation to Palestinian refugees being denied the right of return. Uh, the report is only the beginning for amnesty. Uh, as you all know, we are a movement um, of uh, over 70 sections, uh, national sections around the world. 10 million members and supporters who we are now mobilizing towards the dismantling of Israel's apartheid against Palestinians. The dismantling will begin with recognition, and this is what we're asking, is to recognize the situation for what it is, that of a domination by one racial group, Jewish Israelis, over another racial group, uh, Palestinians, in what amounts to a crime against humanity of apartheid. In uh, our campaigning, we're focusing on the theme of a home, the home of how Palestinians are being denied a home. And this is how we're able to link the different fragments uh, of uh, the Palestinian experience uh, under apartheid. So we're calling to protect Palestinian homes from home demolitions, forced evictions, and family separation. We're calling on to rebuild Palestinian homes that have been destroyed through home demolitions or military, uh, 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 military offensives on, on Gaza in particular, and to have Palestinians return home, uh, those who have been denied the right uh, to return uh, after being forcibly displaced in 48 and 67. Uh, this we see as uh, uh, the being denied the home was one of the main pillars of the system of apartheid and what defines the Palestinian experience 
uh, living under apartheid. I mean, it's a first step towards uh, dismantling uh, of the system. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sahle. That was um, concise and uh, really sets out, hopefully, uh, the uh, the basis for some good questions coming up at the end of the speakers. Uh, next, I'd like to call Yasmin Ahmed, who is the UK Director of Human Rights Watch and who, as we've just heard from Sahle, um, her and her organisation did some uh, phenomenally pioneering work, which I think really started this conversation in a much bigger way. So over to you, yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Baroness Vasi, and thank you very much, Saleh, uh, as well, and the Amnesty uh, broader movement for the work that you have done um, on this issue. Um, as you note, we came out with a report about six months ago, um, which is very similar in finding to the Amnesty International report, and we are extremely um, you know, we, we feel very, very fortunate that, that, that we've had Amnesty International to be able to echo and now propel the, the, the message that we have been saying. And as Saha rightly noted, has actually been the message that Palestinian human rights organisations have been saying for over two decades. But I think it's important that organisations like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch are able to amplify and echo uh, the words and the experiences every single day of Palestinian people on the ground and I think that's really the forefront as Saleh said of all of these discussions is what has and what is the experience of Palestinian people on the ground. Now we as an organization have been working on, on Israel-Palestine like Amnesty for many decades um, and really we the culmination of our work looking at discrimination within the context of Israel and Palestine really came to a point where we felt it necessary to assess whether this discrimination rise to the level of discrimination that would amount to the crime of apartheid. And obviously that's extremely significant. So we made obviously an independent determination of whether that was so. And as we, as we know, we came to the conclusion that in fact, the Israeli authorities are committing the crime of apartheid. And I think it's very important to note that in other situations, we often make determinations which is, are often limited or subject to condition where we say it may be, it is possible that a country is doing something, a state is doing something. In this case, the situation on the basis of our independent analysis, which also took us years to come to, was that the state of Israel is committing the crime of apartheid. Now, just not, not to go over again what Saleh um, has already set out so well, but really just to reiterate, in our determination, we said that the, the crime of apartheid can be broken out, down into three elements. And the first element is the intent element. And uh, again, as Saleh noted, it's the, the Israeli government policy, what we have documented, that has sought to engineer and maintain a Jewish majority and maximise Jewish control over demographics and land areas under its territory. So the intent to dominate is the first pillar and the first element of, of the crime of apartheid. And we set out very systematically um, and very clearly uh, the statements and the policies and the actions of the Israeli government, which give rise to a determination that in fact, there is that intent to dominate. One example, just one example being the, the Knesset law in 2018, the nation state law that was passed, which affirms the Israeli state nation, the, sorry, Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, declaring that within the territory, the right of self-determination is unique to the Jewish people and establishes establishing a Jewish settlement as a national priority. It flows through our uh, policies around the, uh, the impetus to maximize land for Jewish communities. Um, and we see that obviously in the settlements in the West Bank and policies around uh, settlements in the West Bank. Obviously also see it very clearly in Gaza. Also see it in Jerusalem, which has obviously come a, a very much into the fore on issues around the plans of uh, and the goals of the Israeli government of maintaining a solid Jewish majority in the city and even having demographic targets, um, which we've been seen, we've been seen recently playing out. Um, the second element being uh, the systematic oppression and um, 
in the OPTs in particular, we found an institutional discrimination in Israel. And we've seen that and documented that in the West Bank. Obviously, it's very clear that the Palestinians are subject to an entirely different law than the Israelis who are living in, in, in the occupied territories, the former uh, being subject to draconian military law and the latter being able to enjoy Israeli law uh, and many more rights under that. Um, and, you know, that also flows through to separate unequal rights, allocation of land, building permits and resources, as well as civil and political rights as well. Um, in in uh, East Jerusalem, as we've noted, um, Israel's civil law guarantees residency rights to Jews, but for Palestinians, conditions residency rights on their condition connections to the city. Um, and obviously in Gaza, we've seen a complete uh, blockade of Gaza for, the, for, for, for now, for many, many years, for the last nine years. Um, and also not only in addition to the blockade, but the repeated use of excessive and indiscriminate force. And then the final element was the, uh, the acts, the inhumane acts and severe deprivation of fundamental rights in the occupied Palestinian territories. And we, we, we grouped these into uh, movement restrictions, um, obviously, again, noting Gaza, but also noting the, in the occupied territories more generally, uh, land expropriation, forcible transfer of populations, denial of nationality and residency rights, which I have mentioned, and mass suspension of civil rights for 5 million Palestinians in particular living in the occupied Palestinian territories. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time before I end just to talk about what our recommendations are for the UK government, because that really, uh, I think, uh, you know, beds in why we're here today. What are we pushing the UK government to do? Now, our report calls for things which I think the UK government are very, very far from doing. And I think it's a journey that we are all taking to try and see how we can push the UK government and other political parties in the UK to take a more proactive and constructive stance on this issue. So we've called for uh, the UK government to impose sanctions. Uh, we've also called for conditioning of arms and military sales and security assistance, um, subject to the, 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 the end of the commissioning of this crime and violations more generally. Um, and obviously the acknowledgement that the crime is in fact taking place. Now, unfortunately, what we have seen um, since the publication and prior to and subsequent to the publication of our report is that the UK government is, is certainly in nowhere near at the state of even acknowledging this crime is taking place, but not even that. What we have seen is the UK government actively undermined or opposed the commission of inquiry that was established by the UN Human Rights Council. Um, we are seeing, we saw a, a very unfortunate and problematic statement uh, by the Prime Minister in respect of uh, investigations and prosecutions by the ICC in relation to, to, to acts committed by Israel. Uh, we are now seeing uh, laws which are being brought into, a, which, which are being proposed around restraining the rights of persons to exercise their rights to call for a boycott. Um, in relation to particular uh, um, um, trade that, 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 that enhances the, the Israeli state's ability to commission these crimes and also a, restrains the ability of public bodies to divest um, when human rights and other concerns are, are, being, are, are raised. So I think what we are now is in an environment where um, we're seeing further and further uh, measures which are being taken to not only um, deny the situation as it currently is, but to stop people from exercising the right to be able to speak to those issues and act on those issues. And what we are at Human Rights Watch are calling for is for political parties in the United Kingdom, including the Labour Party, obviously the Conservative Party and other parties, to make very clear their position on this issue and very clear what they think the UK government should be doing in respect of this issue, because without that political pressure, nothing will move. Thank you very much.
thank you so much, uh, Yasmin. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Asil Bedoun, uh, who is the Advocacy and Communications Officer at Medical Aid for Palestinians. So um, over to you, Asil. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Saleh, and thank you, Yasmin, uh, and for, uh, thank you for everything you're doing. So let me start by introducing uh, Medical Aid for Palestinians, uh, MAP. Uh, it's a UK-based uh, charity working uh, for a future where all Palestinians can access an effective, sustainable, and locally-led system of healthcare and the full realization of the rights to health and dignity. And we have offices uh, in the West Bank, Gaza, and Lebanon, and we work through local partnerships to provide access to essential healthcare services and build local knowledge and skills and respond to emergencies. Uh, and that's why I think maybe in my briefing, I will have an added value as I'm actually uh, in the West Bank, so I can give you uh, um, a look on what's actually going on. And across our areas of operation uh, at MAP, we have seen the impact uh, of decades of Israeli control over many aspects of Palestinian uh, life through occupation, blockade, annexation, and the permanent uh, displacement of Palestinian refugees. Uh, even though the conditions of uh, Palestinians where MAP's area of operation is working is distinct, but they're all connected by policies and practices imposed on, the, uh, imposed on them collectively by Israel, based on nationality and ethnicity, uh, as Yasmin and Saleh have described. And this has been preventing the Palestinians from enjoying um, rights to health and dignity, and fragmenting both uh, Palestinian society and the uh, healthcare system available to us. Uh, at MAP, we have documented these conditions in our recent position paper. If you haven't seen it, it was uh, published in November last year. It's available uh, on our website. Maybe it, uh, it's not um, adopting the strong language as Amnesty or um, a Human Rights Watch um, uh, reports, but it's still a very strong report. And I'll be providing you a brief update from my view here in the West Bank. Maybe it's going to be a long uh, brief, but when we discuss the Israel's policies in the OPT, you know, we can talk endlessly. Let me start by the systematic discrimination and fragmentation of Palestinian society, which can be most clearly seen in communities MAP serves in Area C of the West Bank. Area C constitutes 60% of the land, and it remains under full Israeli military and uh, civil control. And Israel here deprives Palestinians of many of the basic building blocks of health, including access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. At the same time, Israeli settlers living illegally on the same land enjoy these in abundance and often at the expense uh, of us, the Palestinians. Israel's discriminatory and restrictive planning regime makes it impossible for Palestinians to construct permanent infrastructure in Area C, including health centers and schools, while privileging settlement uh, construction. And by this, it leaves the community members permanently afraid that their homes will be demolished and relay it on emergency stopgap measures like uh, the mobile clinic that MAP is supporting. Through our partners, we have been witnessing the impact of this discriminatory context on Palestinians' health on a daily basis. For example, um, we work with a community called the Trifat. It's in the Jordan Valley in Area C. It's a Bedouin community, and we serve uh, through our partner, a mobile clinic. Saida uh, told me, she's a mother um, uh, from this community, that because there is no uh, health center, there's no clinic nearby, she had to travel a very long way to the nearest hospital when her daughter cut her finger. The delay in accessing treatment for a relat relatively minor and treatable injury led to a significant blood loss and a 10 day stay at the hospital. So against the backdrop of those um, restrictive practices, Palestinians also face uh, growing violence from settlers carried out with total impunity, and the rate of which uh, reached a five-year high in 2021. Again, Saida told me that her children asked her to go with her to the toilet. You know, in Bedouin communities, toilets are outside because at any moment, uh, settlers may raid uh, the community and start attacking them, which is true. This fundamentally uh, discriminatory situation has uh, led to uh, severe health inequalities between Palestinians and Israelis. For example, the life expectancy for Palestinians in the OPT is almost nine years less than it's for Israelis. And the rate of deaths for newborns and children under five is more than five times higher in the OPT than it is in Israel. Uh, 
And the rate of women dying during childbirth is nine times higher among Palestinian women and than women in Israel. So it's important to note that Israel's discriminatory policies also extend beyond the West Bank too. We should mention that Israel's illegal closure and blockade of Gaza has isolated the population from the West Bank and East Jerusalem through a policy of separation. Discriminatory restrictions on the movement of people and goods in and out of Gaza routinely prevent patients uh, getting to care and have resulted in a man-made humanitarian crisis characterized by high rates of poverty, unemployment, and food insecurity. Meanwhile, Israel's decades-long denial of Palestinians' refugee right of return to their homeland has kept the communities we serve in Lebanon in a state of perpetual man-made humanitarian crisis. For as long as Israel's coercive and discriminatory control and its systematic denial of Palestinian rights continues with impunity, the humanitarian situation is only going to deteriorate further and health and equality to grow. This is why at MAP, we urge, we urge you, the lawmakers in the UK, to re recognize the reality of systematic discrimination and fragmentation against the Palestinian people as a whole, not only in the West Bank and take all diplomatic and politi political measures to ensure Israel reverses these policies and practices. We think that the UK should use its diplomatic power to support accountability for continuous violations of international law in the OPT, which undermines the Palestinians' health and dignity, including through the UN Independent Commission of Inquiry established by the UN Human Rights Council last year and the International Criminal Court place Palestinian self-determination at the heart of the UK's aid policies, ensuring that the UK not only responds to emergencies with, the, with humanitarian support, but also drives a sustainable, locally-led development of healthcare and other institutions. Finally, ensure that Palestinians' voices are included and heard at every level of policy-making discussions that concerns us and our rights. There should be no discussion talking about us without us. Thank you for listening and uh, sorry if it took me long to explain. Uh, not at all, Asil. Thank you very much for that. And thank you not just for the um, essential medical services that MAP provide, but also for the documentation of this essential information, which forms the bedrock of uh, the reports that people like Amnesty, Human Rights Watch and others are able to do. And thank you personally uh, for uh, allowing me to visit uh, some years ago now and to see the work firsthand of med medical aid for Palestinians and the fact that it is a lifeline uh, for so many Palestinians, especially women. Um, our final speaker today um, is um, uh, Nuria Oswald from the International Legal and who is the International Legal and Advocacy Director at the Al Mizan Center for Human Rights. So Nuria, over to you. Thanks very much and uh, great to see everyone today. Um, for those we haven't met with and I, I recognize a number of names on the call uh, from our advocacy in the UK, uh, but we're a Palestinian human rights organization based out of three offices in the Gaza Strip and with a focus on Gaza and um, two staff based in Geneva. Um, so I'll say at the top that El Misan's position on apartheid is uh, fully in line with the position uh, that my colleagues put forward from Amnesty and, and Human Rights Watch before me, um, that being the position that Israel has uh, imposed and maintains an apartheid system against all Palestinians, so against those in the OPT, and including in Gaza, um, against those in Israel, and, and against those in, in exile uh, and as refugees abroad. I, I won't go into the legal framework um, in, in, in an in-depth way, but we'll rather look at the human consequences in particular uh, on Palestinians in, in Gaza. Um, now, El Mizan issued a new report recently on apartheid, um, but of course we've been working on the issue um, for many years. Um, but our new report looks specifically at how uh, Israel instrumentalizes uh, this, this framework um, in the Gaza Strip. And it's called the Gaza Bantustan, uh, Israel's apartheid in the Gaza Strip, and I'll, I'll send a link uh, in the chat uh, afterwards. Um, and our research shows that strategic fragmentation uh, 
being the forced division of, of the Palestinian people on a, on a policy level is a key tool of Israel's apartheid system. Um, and, and one of the clearest and most blatant examples of this is, is in the segregation of, of Palestinians in Gaza under Israel's closure and blockade regime, which will enter its 15th year uh, this summer in, in June. Uh, and in our report, we discussed how Israel's intent to dominate and oppress Palestinians is borne out specifically in Gaza, and that's primarily through its militarized, uh, enforced militarily enforced closure, sorry, and movement restrictions, um, which are very much an instrument of this fragmentation, um, but also through uh, excessive use of force and recurrent targeting of civilians, so in both cases leading to uh, large-scale life-altering injuries and fatalities, uh, and also through the denial of fundamental rights and freedoms, um, among them the right to health. And, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, the humanitarian catastrophe is a, that, that we see in Gaza today is, is very much a, a direct result uh, of Israel's system of, of restrictions. Um, it leads to crippling poverty rates, unemployment, food insecurity, aid and dependency, um, and a healthcare system that is um, constantly teetering on, on collapse um, and periodically then further weighed down. So in the last few years, we saw, um, of course, a, an increase of patients from the, from the spread of COVID-19, but also from uh, the May military escalation on Gaza. And in the years before that, we saw full-scale military escalations uh, periodically, uh, of course, as well. Um, and the, the May 2021 escalation led to massive destruction, including of homes. Um, it led to family loss and injury and to widespread uh, long-term trauma. And this is another element of uh, Israel's oppression uh, and control, um, being its use of, of military targeting uh, as a form of domination. And we recently compl uh, completed our monitoring and documentation on the ground of the May uh, escalation, and we documented the killing of 240 Palestinians, uh, 151 of them being civilians by the Israeli military. So 63% were civilians, um, among them 38 women and 59 children. And almost 50% of the victims were killed inside their homes without warning. And that includes 37 of the 38 women killed. And uh, we documented many cases that uh, blatantly and very clearly violated uh, the IHL norms that, uh, that regulate the conduct of hostilities. Um, we documented the killing of another 21 Palestinians in Gaza by Palestinian rockets. Um, and we documented nearly 2,000 Palestinians wounded by the Israeli military, among them 630 children. Um, and many of the, of the 2,000 wounded, of course, needed and still need extensive and, and specialized medical care that the hospital system in Gaza isn't uh, equipped to provide. Um, and El Mizan also represents patients in Gaza who are being denied the care uh, that they need, either um, being referred for care in the West Bank, Israel, or abroad. And uh, we represent these patients before the Israeli authorities. And what we document is, uh, is, an, is an unrelenting and, and flagrant violation of, of the right to health of Palestinians in Gaza. Um, they're continuously denied um, or, or not granted the permits that they need by the Israeli authorities through um, an arbitrary permit, uh, permit process, um, very much a, a complex and opaque set of uh, procedures that they have to face. But, um, a system that strategically targets Palestinians uh, as a racial and, uh, and ethnic group. And we've been engaging for years for, um, you know, we're 22 years old. So since the start of our mandate with the Israeli authorities in various ways, including with the Israeli justice system uh, on the issues that I've just described. And our engagement conclusively demonstrates that the system is primarily geared towards shielding perpetrators from uh, criminal responsibility. Um, that it's not a genuine uh, justice system, but uh, rather one designed uh, to provide impunity, designed to whitewash crimes against Palestinians. And it's this impunity that allows for the continuation of the conditions 
that I've described, that, that my, the colleagues you know, coming before me have described, um, and it allows for the imposition and the maintenance of uh, a system of apartheid. Um, and this is why, this impunity is why Elmizan represents uh, Palestinian clients through international legal procedures. Um, so it's why we're cooperating with the International Criminal Court, um, with the UN, it's why we use all international accountability mechanisms that are uh, available to Palestinians. Um, but chiefly among them right now, uh, being the new commission of inquiry, um, tasked by the, the, human right, the UN Human Rights Council to um, look primarily at, at root causes, um, but you know, also to process and store uh, evidence, also to identify perpetrators. Uh, so because of uh, the lack of compliance that we see from uh, the state of Israel uh, with its, its international legal obligations and because of this unrelenting system of, of violations that, that keeps Palestinians um, from being able to access their, their fundamental rights, you know, including as is documented by El Mizan on the ground, um, we have to work with international justice mechanisms and, uh, and they play such a crucial role, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, seeking the respect of international law in the region. So I'll stop there, but of course, very happy to answer, answer questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nuria, um, and um, and thank you very much, uh, Kabul for uh, and Joe at Kabul for posting in the chat the various reports that have been mentioned, the various additional resources. Uh, feel free to to download those. Um, I know we haven't got much time, and we've lost yes, and I think we've probably just about to lose. Uh, Sally as well, maybe he's just having to step out. Um, does anybody have any questions? Do you, either if you want to raise your hand or if you want to put it in the chat section, that will be helpful. Um, I can't see any raised hands unless I'm, unless I'm, yeah, I actually can't see any raised hands. Uh, unless, or if I can't see the raised hands, just to um, just well, and ask. Oh, hi, Afsal. Right. Uh, do you have a question for us? I, I do. And the question okay. is a real sim simple question, and that is, you know, when we talk about apartheid, most people in the world think of South Africa. And in that context, you know, many would argue, uh, particularly from the Israeli side, saying, but this is not a right comparison, that many Palestinians uh, and other groups in Israel occupy many other positions in the society. So it's not quite the apartheid that was in South Africa. Therefore, more accurate way of saying it is that there are elements of apartheid. What does the panel say on that? A question. Um, is Saleh still in the call? Or, because I know Yasmin's no longer in the call. There are other people from Amnesty, I understand. So, um, yeah, Christian, could you take that for us? Go on, we should just jump in quickly. Thank and thanks for that question. And it's, um, I'm not saying it is here, but it has been a, a common misdirection from Israeli authorities uh, to say, well, this is nothing like South Africa. We're making it very clear in, in, in our findings, in the report, in the press release, that we're not linking this to South Africa. There are similarities, but it's about the crime of apartheid uh, with regards to the apartheid convention uh, and the wrong statute. And, and, and I think that's very clear in the press release. So I would just say that without going into all the detail about the convention and, and, and the statute, that it's not about uh, South Africa in this context. It's about international law, applicable international law um, in this case. Um, thank you. I understand Paul has a question, Paul Bloomfield. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, very much, Saida. And I guess I'm following on from uh, Afsal's question. I was, I was in the leadership of the anti-apartheid movement for 20 years, and I'm just a little bit concerned that um, uh, although, as I think Christian just said, there are you know, significant characteristics of apartheid um, uh, in, the, uh, in the situation in Israel, as indeed, um, as uh, Salah said earlier, there are in Myanmar, um, which has also been called out. 
whether the actual use of apartheid and this campaign around the use of apartheid is um, strictly accurate or indeed helpful in building solidarity because I worry that it's going to lead to a, and is already leading to a, a very distracting argument uh, about whether Israel is, uh, is an apartheid regime or not, as opposed to focusing on the crimes that Israel's committing and the injustices that we're seeing daily. I'm also a little bit concerned um, that it's being associated um, with the call for uh, comprehensive um, boycott, divestment and sanctions, which is of course a characteristic of the anti-apartheid movement, um, which is not going to land, uh, as opposed to the sort of economic sanctions that I think that we should be uh, pressing for, which I think uh, Yasmin talked about, focusing on the uh, isolation of the illegal settlements and, um, and, and defensive weapons. So I, I worry it's, uh, it's not entirely accurate uh, or useful in building effective solidarity. Thank you, so, thank you so much for that, Paul. And can I ask Debbie to ask her question as well? And then I'll probably refer Sally to see if he can pick up both. And then anybody else who wants to come in. Sorry, trying to, uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to, uh, there we go. Um, morning, morning, everyone. Yeah, I, I, I um, take the point from Afsal and, and from Paul as, as, as well. And I remember when, when I visited um, uh, back in 2014, and I, I used the phrase apartheid, and I was told, no, you can't use it. It, uh, um, it, it just isn't appropriate. I wonder what has changed since then to enable, you know, to to uh, enable uh, organisations to feel that this is an appropriate time to to uh, to call it that. My second point is, I don't think there are, apart from yourself, Saida, all all credit to you. I don't think there are any other uh, conservatives on the on the call. So everybody here, I'm sure, recognises everything that is 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 going on in. OPT and it it just is yeah everybody feels it but as a minority part, party uh, and as a my, you know, minority opposition the we will not succeed in changing things without bringing on more conservatives so what given that foreign policy from the conservatives is all focused it has been up until now perhaps things may change uh, on um, on the economy and benefits to the economy, how can we make the arguments to the Conservatives on human rights grounds? Uh, two really good questions. Sally, do you want to, uh, to take the questions and then I may come back on the kind of Conservative Party problem? Sure, thank you. Um, uh, with, with regards to the question about the, kind of the usefulness, accuracy, um, um, it, one is, and, and, and this is to echo what my colleague Christian has just said. I mean, we are, we were not, the report does not, come, our reports and other reports, uh, which we've read and also kind of built on, uh, do not seek to draw a comparison between then the situation of apartheid in South Africa and then the one here or in Myanmar. Apartheid has been defined in international law as a crime against humanity, both in the convention and the Rome Statute. This is the definition that we base then uh, the report on. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, and then in my intervention that uh, we've uh, recognizing uh, that amnesty uh, needs a tool uh, to be able to combat situations of institutionalized discrimination, uh, reaching then the crime of, of, uh, against humanity of apartheid, developed a policy depending, you know, that is very much based on, on these definitions under international law of the crime against humanity of apartheid and with guidelines to how then we tackle uh, through research and legal analysis these situations uh, and then allowing us whether to reach a conclusion of an apartheid being perpetrated or, or, or not. Um, uh, that has indeed been the case in, in, uh, in Israel and Palestine is according to the definition uh, of the crime of apartheid, which is the domination of one racial group over another through a system and perpetrating of unlawful acts, crimes in widespread and systematic manner against the civilian population to maintain uh, this system of oppression and domination. 
the report, our report, Human Rights Watch, I'm not here to kind of speak for them, others, uh, Palestinian human rights organizations have been doing this for the past couple of decades, see that the definition of the crime apply to Israel's policies towards Palestinians. It is a system, a grave human rights violation and crime against humanity. So um, it, it, what we see as then very important and crucial is, uh, and I'll say a point about solidarity because I just returned from a trip to South Africa uh, where the solidarity there is just uh, uh, amazing. Uh, and not only at the level of people, but also at the level of government. Um, and you could say the same as Namibia and some others where uh, uh, people are uh, appreciating that human rights organizations have now completed this consensus and that the approach needs to be to tackle the root causes. And this is actually what the UN has kind of come to say. They haven't said apartheid yet. We certainly hope that the Commission of Inquiry that is set up by the Human Rights Council would consider that apartheid is one of the root causes that they want to investigate in Israel and occupy Palestinian territories. But you know, last year there was this realization, which is very important, that without addressing the system, without addressing the root causes, the human rights crisis in Israel and Palestine will just continue to perpetuate. And, and this is what we're doing here, is we're calling the situation for what it is, a crime against humanity of apartheid, saying that the only way that we're able to stop the perpetuating of human rights, patterns of human rights violations, is accountability, is by dismantling the system of oppression and domination. We have opportunities. I mentioned the Commission of Inquiry. There's an open investigation at the International Criminal Court. We're certainly calling on the Office of the Prosecutor to include the investigation into the crime of apartheid. Uh, we're also hoping that the UN General Assembly, and here we'll be looking at also the UK to support a resolution that would establish the committee uh, on apartheid, not only to look into the situation of Israel and Palestine, but also anywhere where apartheid may be taking place around the world. Uh, so uh, these situations of institutionalized discrimination reaching the violent and severe form of apartheid exist. They are here in Israel and Palestine, and uh, they have no place in the world. This is not an issue of narrative. This is an issue of international law and a crime against humanity. Um, it, with regards to uh, the question about what, what has changed, I mean, I, I hope I addressed this a little bit, that, you know, as an organization speaking uh, on, for Amnesty now, is, is realizing that the organization, seeing that forms of institutionalized discrimination being prevalent around the world, that we needed to tackle, uh, to tackle this more seriously. Um, uh, uh, we have, uh, as an organization, compared to them, Palestinians and, orga and, and Israeli organizations come, uh, come a bit later on this. But I think it's very significant that now, with Amnesty's report, the consensus among the human rights movement is complete. This consensus needs to grow to recognize the situation for, for what it is. And for this year, and we have a report by the Special Rapporteur, hopefully coming up also, on, the, on apartheid, the Commission of Inquiry will be calling on it to investigate the crime of apartheid, that this year becomes a turning point when it comes to a system of oppression and domination for Israel. And that from here on, this is really the road towards dismantling the system. Uh, and we really hope that everybody here on this call and others uh, in the UK and all around the world would stand on the right side of history when it comes to Israel's apartheid against Palestinians. Um, I think, uh, Paul, uh, I think Baroness Odin wants to ask a question. Uh, Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to be speaking following um, Saleh Hagazi. I, I think we have developed an a, a international blindfold uh, against the um, people of Palestine, and it's gone on for so long. We've become completely oblivious to what is fact and what is truth. And I think that um, uh, the fact that today we stand uh, accused, the West stands, both UK and um, US stands as apologies for, you know, some of what's happening uh, internationally, um, that we have become completely, you know, blind to the fact that um, Israel continuously break uh, international law. And uh, um, I just want to ask a question that um, the, the panelists will be aware that both UK and um, US are being accused um, uh, of hi hypocrisy in their uh, politics, in their strategies, in their outlook, their actions, uh, as we see play out 
of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, so there are lots and lots of you know reports, um, in, in not just yours, but uh, in the social media. What do you say about that? How do you respond to the fact that uh, US and UK in particular stands accused of hypocrisy? And what else can you know all of us do collectively to try and address these situations? Because we've all spoken up about these matters for too long without any attention being taken either by the Labour Party or the Conservative. It's, it's, it's not just the Tory party. I think we would let, we'd be really irresponsible if we let uh, Labour Party get off the hook here. Thank you, uh, Brian uh, Pauline uh, McNeil, I think you have a question as well. We, we, we've only got four minutes, so I think we'll take this as the last question and then we'll let Stella respond. Um, th thank you very much. Um, I'm chair of the Cross Party Group in Scotland. I just wanted to say to Paul, I was just going to post this on the chat, that um, all credit to the Tories who are part of this group, because we don't have any in Scotland. Ben Wallace was the only member ever to attend, and to his credit. Um, I've been in that for 25 years, and not a term I would use for the reasons that Paul said that I felt as a distraction to the argument. But the question of a party is a legal question. And to me, the amnesty report, which I think Salva said took four years, um, has some authority, I'd have thought. I just wanted to just ask the question very quickly. Um, the, the problem is there isn't a distraction at the moment, surely. But no one's really covering the deep-rooted violence that is happening now that's worse than ever. Um, but Sal, I mean, it, surely it's a question that it is or it isn't. I mean, it's Bishop Tutu said many years ago that um, it was worse. In, it was worse initially in South Africa. I think it was Bishop Tutu who said it. So, would you agree then? That it's not a question of whether we think it's apartheid. It is a legal and factual definition that you're applying. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, and before we come back to you, Sally, to respond to that, Asil and Nuria, is there anything the two of you want to come back in on any of the questions that have been asked? No, no. Uh, Sally, I'll leave it to you. Sorry, I'll, I'll be very brief and also look at uh, then uh, uh, my, my uh, colleagues from Amnesty here, uh, Colin and Christian, if they want to come in uh, also. Um, uh, I mean, very briefly, it's, it, it, you know, on, on, the first, on the first question about uh, uh, the hypocrisy, uh, what I want to say is, is that basically what we're calling for is for Israel to be held to the same standard as to then other countries when they are violating human rights, when they are committing war crimes, when, when they're committing crimes against humanity. What is very clear that Israel is held to a much lower standard when it comes to other countries who practice, uh, you know, who, 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 who perform basically similar, similar practices. So, uh, and we really look to everyone here uh, to, uh, a, a, to, 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 to say this and, and to ensure that the UK also plays a role where everyone is treated, you know, that the rule of law, that you have a rule of law and everybody is equal under that rule of law, everybody is treated to the same standard. What we have been seeing, and it's the impunity that Israel enjoys and which the UK and other countries allied to Israel have contributed to, is what allows then a crime against humanity to be perpetrated against Palestinians right now. This would not have been possible if Israel was just held to the same standard than when it comes to other countries that are violating human rights. Um, uh, I, I mean, to, um, uh, to Pauline, uh, and it, that, that is exactly it. I mean, we're, we're here not doing a social, the, the report is not a sociological study. It's not a comparative study. Uh, it's not that of politics. It is taking a definition that is uh, of a crime under international law uh, and in two major documents, the Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid and the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and saying, which are, you know, the, the two definitions are very close to each other, and saying that under this definition, under these definitions, and based on, on evidence, uh, based on documentation, uh, scientific, professional documentation that Amnesty International has been carrying out for over two decades, there is indubitable. Uh, evidence and proof that Israel is perpetrating crime against humanity of apartheid against Palestinians. Uh, a question in color. 
you want to come in? Yeah, can I just come in quickly? Sorry, Christian, is that okay? Just quickly on the consistency point. I think there is a clear lack of consistency from the UK government. And you can see just this morning, um, Dominic Raab, the Justice Secretary, has been on um, the, the radio, the, the TV programme, saying that um, if Putin is committing war crimes in Ukraine, then he you know, will face um, a trial at The Hague and, and, should, and maybe will face many years um, behind bars as a result. Um, and, and specifically saying that the UK will um, support the preservation of evidence of war crimes and will support the ICC investigation. Well, even if you put apartheid aside, um, the illegal settlements, for example, are clearly a violation of international law. And the UN has already said that illegal settlement buildings are a, a war crime. And yet with the ICC investigation of Israel, the prime minister last year um, said that he did not support that investigation. And we do not see the same language. So I think, and this leads on to response to the other question of you know, how we move things forward. I think there does need to be a lot more pressure um, from cross-party parliamentarians on the UK to make sure that Israel does face consequences. And, and of course, as everyone has said, we're applying a legal definition and we think it is very important to call it what it is, the crime of apartheid is being committed. But let's also focus on the consequences that Israel should face for the crimes that the international community already accepts are being committed. So where is the consequence for the continued illegal settlement building? Where is the consequence for the continued human rights violations and, and restrictions on movement and systematic discrimination, et cetera? So one of the things that we're really, really pushing for is a ban on settlement goods. Um, just removing them from trade preferences, it does not go nearly far enough. And we'd like to see um, the Labour Party take that as a party, uh, party position. The Lib Dems took that as a position last year, so Labour MPs on the call, that's something that you could be pushing for internally with the Labour Party, but also in debates, in questions, really start to push the UK government on why that is that is not a position that's being taken. And obviously the, the UK is currently negotiating a free trade agreement, and so there'll be various opportunities for, for those kind of um, asks and, and recommendations to be made. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all the speakers. I think we're starting to lose some of the people who are attending the call. It was due to finish at 11 o'clock. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all the speakers and uh, to Kabul for organising this. There is another event on the 8th of March, which again has been posted uh, in the chat. Uh, so do take a look at that. That's in relation to settler violence. That's something that, again, that's been mentioned in the briefing um, today. Um, and I think that's where we conclude it. Thank you.